Good morning, everybody. Welcome again. It's great to see you. We want to welcome everybody online. We are so thankful for our online presence. Each and every one of you matter dearly to the Hilltop Church. So thank you. Thank you for joining us for this time of worship. And thank all of you who are here in person today. It's great to have you with us as well. Not quite so sunny in El Segundo, but it's good to be here. I know it might need a coat this morning. But uh, we are thankful that we have this uh, opportunity to worship outside, and we uh, are really enjoying this time as well. So I hope you are being blessed by Nehemiah. I, I just love this letter. I feel like it is so relevant uh, to what we are going through today, even though it was written 450 years before Jesus uh, walked the face of this earth, right? And uh, so Nehemiah, God put in Nehemiah's heart that he was to rebuild the city of God. Nehemiah, of course, was living in Persia, and the, the Jewish people, God's children, were in exile, if you remember. They were all brought to, uh, well, they were scattered out of Jerusalem. Some were living in uh, Susa. That's where Nehemiah was living. He was actually cupbearer to the king which means he would drink the wine before serving it to the king to make sure it wasn't poisoned. It's kind of a good job if you're wine taster for the king. It's kind of a bad job if it's poisoned and then you die, right? But, uh, but that, that was his role. And, but, but here's the thing. Remember, we saw God put in his heart. It says God put in his heart to rebuild Jerusalem because the walls were torn down, they were in rubble. And as we'll see this morning, rubble is trouble, okay? Um, at least that's what these naysayers, you know, were saying. But by the way, I titled this sermon, Don't Let the Jerks Get You Down, okay? Don't let the jerks in life get you down. And that's what, exactly what we're gonna learn from Nehemiah. He didn't let the jerks get him down and he allowed God to turn his trouble into triumph. Think about that this morning. In fact, if, if you're at home, say this with me. If you're here, say this with me. God turns our trouble into triumph. Say that with me. God turns our trouble into triumph. God specializes in that. He absolutely loves that. So as, as, as and Nehemiah, the good news this morning is Nehemiah is going to show us how that happens. So if you have trouble in your life, we all do, right? Various times, various levels, we all have trouble and worries and anxiety and challenges. Jesus told us in this life you will have what? Trouble. Say it a little louder. In this life you will have trouble. Always reminds me of I'm the music man. We got trouble right here in River City with a capital T and that rhymes with P and that stands for pool. Trouble. <laughs> and... So Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. Just because you're a Christian doesn't mean everything's just going to be wonderful. Even trying to do the will of God, it doesn't mean things are just going to be fantastic. Trying to do the will of God. Sometimes trying to do God's will is even harder. Because that's when the enemy attacks. If you're not into Christianity, if you don't know Jesus, if you're not walking the walk, if you're just out doing your thing, Satan's happy. As soon as you try to follow God, Satan's going to come after you. We know that. Today, Christians are being persecuted across the world. Now, in America, we don't have people dying. We don't have people getting their heads chopped off. But across the world, there is persecution for people who put their faith in Jesus Christ. People are being slaughtered, slaughtered for their faith. So there's trouble, and that's what we see in Nehemiah chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, please turn there. Nehemiah chapter 4, I'll read it for you if you don't have your Bible. You know, it's interesting to me that even before Nehemiah gets, uh, gets to Jerusalem, he already faces these, the Sanballat, and Tobiah and the Arabs. Okay, that's trouble for Nehemiah. And you're going to see that's trouble in Nehemiah chapter 4. 
Trouble comes in many forms, you see. Trouble comes in the form of people, but people are not the ultimate source of trouble. The enemy, the devil, we talked about last week, prowls around looking for someone to devour. He is the enemy. But listen to this here. Let me read this. And, and then we're going to go through how God turns trouble into triumph, our trouble into triumph. You ready? Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and, uh, the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? We, will they restore the wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Amorite, who was at his side, said, What are they building? Even a fox climbing on it would break down their wall of stones. And then Nehemiah's go-to is what? Prayer. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. They're building the wall. God's people are building the wall and they're throwing insults in their face. Verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half of its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sambalot, Tobiah, and the Arabs, and the Amorites, and the people of Ashad heard that the repairs to Jerusalem walls had gone ahead, and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God, and posted a guard day and night to meet their threat, this threat. Verse 10, meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is such, so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and we'll put an end to the work. Verse 12, then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall and exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears, and bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, listen, here, listen to this. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. And I, I, I got to stop there. I, that's, that's one of my favorite verses here in chapter four. I, I, I'm reminded of Braveheart for some reason. I don't like that. You know, when Mel Gibson's <laughs> Uh, is out in front riding that horse. He's fight for your women, fight for your children. I mean, that's kind of the cry. But here's the thing. God is great and God is awesome. And we are not fighting alone. God is with us. So, it starts out with a put-down contest. Now, in other words, they're kind of using psychological warfare. The Sambalot, Tobiah, the enemies, right? They're just kind of, have you ever been in a put-down contest? I, I remember coming back, I played football in high school, and coming back from our football games, we'd be on the bus, and somebody would stand up and put somebody down. It, it's, it was in fun, not just to be mean, but, you know, who could put somebody down worse? And it usually involved your mama this or your, your mama that. I don't know why we, I guess that's the ultimate put-down, right, is, is putting down somebody's mother. But that's what's going on here. It is a major verbal smackdown. If they had social media at that time, what they would have done is just start slamming people on social media. That's, that's what they're doing. Why are they doing that? They're trying to get in their head. That's what Satan does. 
Satan wants to get in your head. And he wants to discourage you. And he wants to leave you in despair. He wants to drive you to despair. And, and, and so they are just shouting these things out. And you can kind of see what's happening. Imagine in your mind if you were there, you know, Sanballat, he's like the head of the Samaritans. He's got all this power and prestige. And he, he stands up and, you know, uh, he, he yells out, out these things. He says, you know, what, what are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? He's asking these rhetorical questions like, no way that they're going to get it done. Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring back the stones from life, from these heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Ha <laughs> ha! And everybody, you can hear the whole cry. Ha ha ha! Look at them. Look at them building that wall. Making fun of them. And then Tobiah, verse 3, he's got to pitch in. He says, even if a, if a little baby fox were to hop up on that wall, those stones would just fall to the ground. And it would be rubble, and the crowd roars with ha, 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 look at them, look at them, you see. Getting in their head, trying to discourage them, trying to bring their hearts down so that they will give up and stop the fight. I want you to remember three things that were learned from, a lot from Nehemiah, but three things. How is God going to bring your trouble into triumph? You got to do three things. God does it, but you got to partner with God. So here's the first thing is you start with prayer. That's where Nehemiah goes. Immediately, it, and this isn't, we see this all throughout Nehemiah, right? Now are you see in his habit, everything immediately to prayer. And that's what he does. Secondly, you have to prepare. You have to pray. You have to prepare. And then... You have to partner, okay? Three things, pray, prepare, partner. Say that with me. Pray, prepare, partner. That's, when you do that, God will take your trouble and he will turn it in to triumph. So this is what Nehemiah does. Now, listen to his prayer. I, I think this prayer is interesting. Like when you pray to God, what do you pray? When you pray for people, what do you pray? Here's his prayer about the enemies. Hear us, our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them as plunder in the land of captivity. Don't cover up their guilt or blot out their sin. These powerful, prestigious, important people are attacking Nehemiah and attacking the people of God in this building project. And so he prays against his enemies and basically he's saying get them lord now jesus said what love your enemies and pray for those who what persecute you does this sound like love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you no it doesn't but here's the thing he's doing the work of the lord and so not only are they ridiculing Nehemiah and Nehemiah's people, they are ridiculing God. Sometimes you have to take a stand for God. And when people are ridiculing or chastising or making fun of God's people, we got to take a stand. But notice this, he doesn't take it into his own hands. He puts it in God's hands. He says, God, you deal with it. And then he has a few suggestions for him, right? <laughs> um, it's like, pray for your enemies. Strike them with lightning, Lord. <laughs> I don't know if that's what, what Nehemiah, or what God had in mind. But, but here's what we need to notice. When trouble comes, the first place we hit is not people, we hit our knees. We hit our knees in prayer. And when we pray, God hears our prayers. And we, we allow God, to, we acknowledge that God is a part of what we are going through. So, the, they start with this psychological warfare of, get, of getting in their head. And then, and then it says that the people just keep working. 
They don't, they don't stop working. They, it, the Bible says that they put their, their they had a, a heart and mind to do the work of the Lord. I, I think we need that. For, for those of you here this morning, for those of you who are online, you know what? We need more than ever workers, laborers for the Lord right now. And, and God is calling you to be a laborer for the Lord. And the people had a heart and a mind to be a laborer for the Lord. And Nehemiah says, church, we got to rise up. Now's the time to rebuild. Now's the time to restore. Here in our neighborhood, here in our community, we are building the Hilltop Community Church of Christ. We are building each other up. We are, we are restoring this community. That's what this church is about. But we need workers. So now, there's something else that's very discouraging that's happening. I don't know if you noticed. Look at verse uh, 3. By the way, they move from psychological threats to physical threats. If they can't get in their head, they're like, we're just going to kill them. They want to kill them to stop the work of the Lord. They don't want God to be honored. You know, Sambalot's a Samaritan. He lives about 14 miles from Jerusalem. He's not interested in honoring God. He's interested in his own power and his own prestige and his own wealth. He serves Persia, not God. Tobiah is a Jew. And you know what Tobiah means by the Lord? By the, by the way, to, to, Tobiah means God is good. That's what his name means. I hear that. God is good all the time. All the time God is good. I, I like it because God is good, right? His name means God is good, but he has no interest in worshiping a good God. He's interested. He, he's like the head of the KGB. He's got family. He's got neighbors. He's got people he knows. He just kind of, he's got these undercover agents that are going around and they're telling him what's the other building here, they're building there. He has no interest in serving God. So, but not only are they discouraging, trying to discourage the builders, the people in the region of Judea are discouraged as well, of Judah. Because look what it says in verse 12. It says, Then the Jews who lived near them came and they told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. So their own people, their own friends, their own neighbors now are, are scared, they're afraid, and they're like, oh, they're going to they're gonna get us ten times over. What does that mean? It's like they said it over and over and over and over again, right? Ten times. And just say it once. Like a broken record. Oh, they're going to get us. They're going to get us. Okay, so first, Nehemiah prays. Second, Nehemiah prepares for the enemy. He prays to God, but he prepares for the enemy. Are you prepared right now for the enemy's attack? Do you, do you know who the enemy is? I, I mean, we think it's people. People, <clears throat> excuse me, people are my enemy. But people are not the enemy. Now, I'll define the enemy for you. But first, I want you to look at verse 9. This is key. He prepares for the enemy to attack. How do we prepare? Verse 9, it says, we prayed to our God and we posted a guard day and night to meet the threat. That's interesting. Take note of that. He prayed and he posted. When I read that, I said that over and again this week. We don't just pray to God. God wants us to do something about it. God wants us to do action. So he posted, he prayed and he posted, prayed and he posted. He prayed to God and he posted a guard in preparation for the attack. So if you want a job, like if you need a job right now, or if you want to switch job, you, you pray to God, and then what do you do? You go apply for jobs. If you want to move right now, I know some folks that are thinking about moving, you pray to God, and then you start looking at homes and filling out your resume. If you want a, a girlfriend, you pray to God and then start asking some girls out, okay? <laughs> right? So <laughs> that's how it works. He prayed and he posted. He did something. God requires action. 
He requires us to come alongside. But here's the ultimate way that we can prepare. And that is, we need to understand that the enemy is not people. People are the agents of the enemy. Did you get that? You think people are your problem? Guess what? People aren't your problem. Oh, if this person at work would just be nicer, if this person in my family would just stop picking on me, if, if this person, that person, right, if Sambalad and Tobiah would just back, no. The Bible tells us clearly the enemy is not flesh and blood. Listen to Ephesians 6, and I want you to write Ephesians 6 down because you need to memorize this passage. This is a passage you memorize to prepare for battle. Because there's a war going on every day for your soul. Ephesians 6 verse 10. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Listen, verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. We have spiritual warfare that's going on, and if you don't know the spiritual warfare for your soul that's going on every day, then you aren't aware of the enemy. Because I guarantee you, Satan's at work. You say, I don't believe in a devil. I don't believe in Satan. Do you believe in evil? Do you see evil in this world? He is the father of evil. And it exists. And he wants to take you down. So wake up. Jesus says, be on the alert. Satan wants to take you, pull you away from God. So Nehemiah knows that that the, the real problem is spiritual. Yeah, these guys are jerks, but I'm not going to let them down because I know God is going to turn my trouble into triumph as I trust in him. And and since I went to uh, uh, Ephesians 6, I got to finish real quick. This is what I want you to memorize. If you want to do battle, here's what you need to memorize. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, it doesn't say if the day of evil comes, it says when the day of evil comes. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. With your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. Satan, every day, bam, 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 every day. So we have to have a shield of faith so we can extinguish all the flaming arrows. Verse 17, take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray. There it is. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. That's how you prepare. So Nehemiah prays, he prepares for the enemy's attack, but he doesn't just spiritually prepare, he physically prepares. What does he do? He like engages in guerrilla warfare. He looks for the lowest points of the wall and he's like, get your swords and your spears and your shields and I'm going to put a group here at this wall. And then they keep attacking so he has the workers with a, listen, they got a sword in one hand and they're building a wall with stones in the other hand. How do you do that? But they're not gonna let the enemy come in. So they got a sword here and a stone here and they're, they're picking up, picking up. See, they're participating. They are partnering with God to build this city and to protect this city. So, 
If you want God to turn your trouble into triumph, you have to pray, you have to prepare, and finally, you have to remember who you partner with. Partnering with God. And that's why I love verse 14. Let me read it again. Don't be afraid of them. Did you know that don't be afraid is probably one of the most said sentences in the entire Bible. It's all throughout the Bible. Don't be afraid. Be strong and courageous and do not be afraid. Jesus says, don't worry. Paul says, be anxious for nothing. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Why do you not have to be afraid? Because God is with you. You are partnered with God and God is great and awesome. God is great and awesome. And that's why you will have triumph over your trouble because you are partnered with God. And that's what he's doing. Don't be afraid. God is great and awesome. Fight for your families and your sons and your daughters and your wives. Fight the good fight. We got to fight. You pray. You prepare. And you partner with God to fight the good fight. Verse 20, uh, 19 says that the work is extensive and spread out is widely separated from each other along the wall. And whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, I want you to join us there because our God, listen, will fight for us. And that's later on in the passage. That's verse 20. So what we're going to do is we're going to sound a trumpet. And wherever you hear that trumpet, everybody go there and fight. And remember who's really doing the fighting for you, and that's God. God will fight for us, and that's why we will be victorious. Sword in one hand, stone in the other. God is great. God is awesome. Pray, prepare, partner with God, and he will take all of your trouble, and he will lead you into triumph. He loves to do that for his children. He wants to do that in your life right now. And Jesus, by the way, understood trouble. Jesus, the Son of God, was not protected from trouble. In Matthew 27, verse 39, it says, Those who pass by, this is when Jesus is on his way to a cross to be crucified for you. Jesus is on his way to his death to be crucified to pay a price for your sins. And on his way to the cross, listen to what they say. Verse 39, Matthew chapter 27, verse 39. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests and teachers of the law and elders mocked him. See, not, not just Nehemiah and those people were mocked. Jesus, the Son of God, was mocked. And he had said he's going to destroy the temple and raise it in three days. And the temple he's talking about is the temple inside of us through his death, burial, and resurrection. Three days he was in the, listen, three days he was in the grave battling Satan on your behalf so that you could be made right with God. God loves to turn our tr trouble into triumph. He wants to do that this morning. The question is, will you trust him? Will you pray? Will you prepare? Will you partner? And will you trust God? Let me close in prayer. And I just want to encourage you at home, if you could bow your heads, close your eyes. And those who are here, go ahead and bow your head, close your eyes. And I'm going to pray a prayer from Ephesians, and then we'll be done with this portion. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of heavenly realms. Holy Father in heaven, may we know this morning when we pray to you, when we prepare, when we partner with you, God, we will find victory and we will find the same power 
that raised Jesus from the dead, God. Father, there's a lot of trouble in our world right now. There's a lot of trouble in America. There's a lot of trouble in the hearts of the listeners this morning. There's a lot of trouble in my heart, Lord. And I just want to turn it over to you through the power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ. And I can't wait to see, God, how you will bring triumph out of our troubles. Father, we love you. We thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us, everybody. So glad you could be with us here today. God bless you.